Hi there, Clarky here from the Phobic Flyer. Welcome back to The Truth About Aviation with Peter Cox. I started learning to fly in 2013 and it took me seven and a half years to get my PPR license due to a debilitating fear of flying. I created this channel to show some of my training and what's next for my flying hobby and to prove that it is possible to overcome a phobia. Welcome to the Phobic Flyer YouTube channel. How do pilots know where they are going on the ground and in the air? We have no idea. No, yeah, it's all no just idea. potluck. It's, it's again, it's another question that I generally get when stepping out to go to the loo. Someone yeah. says, where are we? Oh, it's a dreaded question. I actually always have to look on a map beforehand. Yeah. I know which country we're over <laughs> yeah. and I know which airports are nearby because that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know what towns we're nearby. Yeah. And because of that, I will generally look at a map to try and give some clue. Yeah. And in my PAs, I'll explain the routing that we're taking and where we're flying over. And if I do an updated PA, I'll again say where we're over and try and find some way that people have heard of. Yeah. Um, but most of the time in the air, we're flying between waypoints. Yeah. So a waypoint is just five characters and they have wacky names and they're designed that even if English isn't your first language, you would be able to understand what, how to spell the waypoint. Okay. Because it's generated by a computer. Yeah. Um, there are some that have names similar to where they are. So uh, south coast of England, you have Portsmouth and Havant. Yeah. There is a waypoint that we quite often route back into the UK called Avant. Okay. And it's A-V-A-N-T. Yeah. So even if you didn't know that haven't existed, yeah. you would be told route to direct avant, yeah. you know where you're going to go. So okay. most waypoints are five characters long. We also route to um, stations yeah. like VORs. So just around the corner from here, we have Brecon. Yeah. So that's three characters. So BCM. That's how we navigate in the air. And the plane is programmed on a defined route from waypoint to waypoint to waypoint from our takeoff runway to our landing runway. Cool. We can update at any point. We can change the landing runway. Uh, we can change the airport if we're diverting. Yep. Um, and if we are given one of those shortcuts that air traffic can give us, we will simply bypass a whole load of waypoints. Excellent. On the ground, it's actually an awful lot harder. Yeah. And Follow a yellow line. Especially at night. <laughs> yeah. Um, major airports are complex. Yeah. And unlike a road that normally has grass either side of it, um, you can find that it's just a huge swathe of tarmac with lots of lines across it, and you have to follow the right one. Yeah. So we have a map in the aircraft uh, on an iPad. Yep. And generally, it will be on the 7-3, the captain is taxiing because he's the only one with a tiller, so that's the steerable nose wheel option. Yeah. And the FO will be giving instructions. So okay. I will say I'm approaching taxiway whatever, and I'm expecting to turn left. I'm expecting confirmation back from the FO that that is the correct in one instruction and two, yeah. the correct taxiway. And then when we turn onto there, he will probably say something like, take the third right and then say the taxi where I'm looking for or the intersection. And I'm then looking for that as we're taxiing along. Okay. Fine on airports I'm familiar with. If you end up somewhere you're not familiar, you taxi a lot slower. Yeah. Because you don't really know where you're going and you're doing it all by looking out the window and then trying to relate it to a map. Even airports that I am very familiar with, when it's foggy, that's a whole new ball game. Yeah, I can imagine. Because you're already quite high. Yeah. And you're looking down onto the ground from quite a height, yeah. trying to follow yellow lines. And if you're really lucky, they have LED lighting everywhere. Yeah. And some of the major airports now have what's referred to as follow the greens. Okay. So it'll be a, a run of green LEDs. And as you taxi over each of them, they turn off in blocks. Oh, cool. So different aircraft follow different sets of greens and they will guide you where you're going. Wow. And that reduces air traffic. Yeah. Because they'll simply say, follow the greens and where you're going to go. And you follow them. Wow. Whereas other airports will have to give you every single waypoint that you're going to taxi along to get to your parking stand or out to the runway. Yeah. Talking about waypoints, can you remember the two that are around Gloucester Airport? Uh, Wotan, I think. Is that part of the R&P approach? It might be. <laughs> okay. not, and Nirmo? Oh, yes. Yeah. Is it Nermo? Nermo's one, yeah, that's in the airway just south. I don't think it's Wotan, that's something else. But okay. anyway, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. When I had my phobia of flying, and, uh, which I've had most of my life, I can remember just after takeoff, um, and also in the initial, which I now know is the sort of initial descent, feeling sometimes like I was being pushed into my chair. It's not a very nice feeling. W why is that? What, immediately on takeoff? Yeah. It's to do with the fact that you're traveling forward and then the aircraft is changing 
its attitude okay. can it still actually attach to the ground yeah so when we take off we rotate the aircraft okay into the air yeah um a novel thing if you're sat in the back row of all aircraft yeah you actually go down before you go up yeah, of course, you will, won't you? Because yeah. the back of the aircraft lowers towards the runway as yeah. the nose comes off the ground to lift. So if you're sat towards the back of the aircraft, again, from one of the comments we had earlier about sort of avoiding those strange sensations, yeah. the back of the aircraft will be worse because you'll feel you'll go down and then you'll be pushed into your seat as the aircraft lifts off the ground oh, okay. just from the G-force involved. It's not a lot, no. but it's acceleration. And it's so enough to feel. Your body will, will feel it. Okay, you mentioned earlier um, go-arounds. Is that, a, is that a thing that happens a lot? Do you do a lot of them or do you do so many a week or so many a day or? <laughs> if you're really unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, they're not common. No. But they're not uncommon. Yeah. If that's a really easy way of answering that. Yeah. Um, it depends on the airport. Okay. And there are two reasons for going round. One is you're instructed by air traffic to go round. Yeah. Because of a situation that has appeared outside your control. And the other one is you decide to go round. Now, it could be that you didn't see the runway. Okay. So you have made an approach to a runway on an instrument approach system in bad weather, and you have achieved the minimum height you're allowed to descend to on that approach. Okay. And you don't see the runway, you have to go round because yeah. it would be dangerous to continue. The other is referred to as getting unstable. Now, for safety, we have very specific rules on how we fly airplanes. Those rules will stipulate when we have the gear down, the flap down, and at correct speeds. Yeah. So we'll be in the landing configuration by a set gate, and we'll be speed stable at a set gate. Okay. If we miss those gates, it's mandatory to go round. Yeah. Because, as they say, no good landings ever come from a bad approach. Yeah. And it's the same adage from light aircraft as it is in... I, in I can ones. remember you telling and me I, that. <laughs> I, have, I have made you go round in the past <laughs> yeah. because I want you to think that... Yeah. If I'm not happy, I should go round. Yeah. And we do that exactly the same. Flying big aircraft is exactly the same as flying little yeah. aircraft. If you're not happy, go round, because no one's ever crashed from flying in through the sky. No. But plenty of people have crashed from doing bad landings. Yeah. Thank you. I can remember, um, I think it was either the very first or one of the very first flights, which I think I think it's where I got my phobia from back in 1980-something, 80, I can't remember. Um it was an approach into um, Corfu. Corfu, yes. Is that notoriously? Yes. Okay, I can remember that, I think we did, he did three go-arounds and every time he said the runway was flooded and the last time it wasn't flood flooded and we landed. Yep. But I thought we were landing in the sea because when I looked out the left window, oh, I could can see, see the sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Corfu runway is surrounded by sea. Yeah. And it extends out into water. Yeah. Uh, it's incredibly picturesque. It's lovely, isn't it? It is beautiful area yeah. to fly into in nice weather. Yeah. It's not so nice in bad weather. Yeah. Um, now, the reasoning behind going around because of a flooded runway is that aircraft stop on the runway using wheel brakes. Yeah. They don't use reverse thrust to stop us. No. We use reverse thrust, but it doesn't. it's not the brain thing that slows the aircraft down. It's no. wheel brakes. So if you have a large amount of standing water, you're going to aquaplane. Uh, okay. And like a car does. Exactly. Yeah. And the runway is only a defined length. Yeah. And then there's sea in yeah. one direction and there's a road and buildings in the other both of which will be a really bad day if you don't stop <laughs> yeah, so for, for both you and it, the uh, exactly <laughs> yeah so corfu is not the longest runway in the world no. and it's not the easiest approach in the world saying back to are there dangerous airports no okay. but corfu is one that we practice and it's one that we take very seriously who's actually going to do the approach yeah and if i'm flying with a very inexperienced new first officer I'm not going to let them do the approach. No, no. Because it's a short runway and it's a challenging one to get into. Okay. But the performance we do before we land, we don't just turn up somewhere and hope we're going to be able to stop. Yeah. We know we can stop before we even start the approach. And I have an iPad that does a lot of the maths for me, unlike yeah. those horrendous charts that I used to make you have to do with a pen and paper. Yes, and I a can remember that. Yes. <laughs> um, so it will tell me. And it has safety factors built into it. But if it is a flooded runway, it will always say no. Okay. Can an aircraft reverse itself from standstill? And if it can, why do they use tugs to push you back from a major airfield? Some aircraft can. Okay. Turboprops can, and I have reversed a turboprop. Have you? Yes. Um, you have the ability to vary the blade angle, and you can generate reverse thrust off the props. Oh. And actually on a turboprop, that is the most effective way of slowing it down on landing. Is it? A jet the reverse thrust is actually more to destroy all the lift around the wing to put all the weight onto the wheels to bring the aircraft to a stop. 
Okay. Um, but there are some. The MD80 yeah. has buckets that go round the exhausts at the back I of the aircraft. I can remember those, yeah. And they have the ability to reverse off stand. Okay. But the downside of it is planes don't come with wing mirrors. No. So I can't see what's behind me. So even if I do reverse, I don't know where I'm going. And if you were to touch the brakes whilst you're reversing, you'll tail tip. Oh, wow. So it's a delicate procedure. Oh, crikey. Yeah. Um, I've done it once in a turboprop because they couldn't find a tow uh, bar that would actually work with the aircraft I was flying. Oh, OK. So they thought we were a different aircraft. When we turned up, they then panicked after we taxied onto stand and then couldn't manoeuvre off the stand forwards or turn out without hitting the wing into one of the lights. Oh, wow. So we had to get approval, and this was at Stansted, so it was quite a logistics work to get approval to reverse an aircraft at Stansted. Did you have people on the aircraft, or did they go This off? was freighter. Oh, OK. This was okay. a freighter, so it only had boxes. Oh, OK. Um, but we ended, up with, <laughs> we ended up with a lot of airfield operation staff around us to make sure it was performed safely. Oh, wow. So we had wing walkers. Yeah. Which isn't as exciting as it sounds. They weren't stood on top of the wings, but they were stood out to the sides of the mm. aircraft, making sure that we weren't going to catch anything. And then there was one person who's marshalling us in front who's got visual sight of everyone around the aircraft. Yeah. And if he says stop, I have to stop. Okay. But I have to do that by applying forward thrust to bring the aircraft to a stop, and then I can apply the brake. Because if I touch the brakes, it would have tail tipped. Thanks, Peter. And don't forget, we've got more questions and answers next week. Please come back and subscribe to the channel so that you can view more questions and answers with Peter Cox. Thank you very much.